What's up, traders? Anthony Cardelli here, and thank you for tuning in to the Futures Radio Show podcast. How to scalp futures. This is actually how I learned how to trade futures. Actually, we're getting feedback. Let's see. Get rid of that. All right, we'll start that over. <laughs> What's up, traders? Anthony Cardelli here, and thank you for tuning in to the Futures Radio Show podcast. How to scalp futures. This is actually how I learned how to trade futures on the trading floor. And it's the style that most of the traders I learned from chose as their style of trading. In today's markets, scalping is as popular as ever, especially with the addition of the micro contracts. Many traders are taking quick scalp trades as their style of trading. Today, I have one of my friends from Twitter. He's known on Twitter as the Cheeto Hunter. And in today's show, he and I will discuss techniques for scalping futures. Today's podcast is sponsored by TradeStation and FTSE Russell. Currently, TradeStation is running a promo just for the Futures Radio Show audience. New users will get 50% off brokerage fees for the lifetime of their account using the promo code F-U-T-R-A-F-Z-T. You can see that in the description down below. Go to tradestation.com slash Anthony to learn more. Are you watching the stock market, specifically the Russell 2000? The Russell 2000 is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 future symbol RTY and micro E-mini Russell 2000 future symbol M2K. To learn more about FTSE Russell and their products, please visit FTSERussell.com. You know, in the house. What's up, my friend? How's it going, Anthony? Great to see you. Uh, you know... We this is the first time we're actually meeting face to face, right? Um, yeah. First time we're talking, and I've been following you on Twitter for a while. I love the content you put out there, and what really initially got me really to starting to following you is just the techniques you put out there, and how you talked about scalping. And, and like I said, I've been around, so I, I know when somebody knows what they're doing versus not. Um, so seeing your content um, was was really good, and. You know, the first thing I want to talk about today really is, and I think this is such an important aspect of becoming a scalper, right? Because that's going to be the focus today is what is it? I mean, I know that there's probably a lot of future traders out there that may not even know what scalping is. Well, you know, scalping is something that uh, I didn't actually start doing. I actually was looking for bigger point gains when I first started out. And I guess I I guess I just kind of fell into the scalping. So scalping is just taking small little chunks of the pie and basically running away. And so, you know, I might take a half a point up to, you know, a couple points and may not trade for the rest of the day. And so it's just getting in and out in pristine uh, levels and points to where your strategy actually uh, lines up with what you're seeing in the market. Yeah, I mean, I think that we got a little, your audio is a, a little scratchy. I don't know if the audience, maybe you guys could hear that as well. Um, but um, if it is, just let me know. Yeah, it says your audio is a little, it's a little scratchy, difficult to hear. Maybe we can uh, get a second, maybe uh, it'll, it'll get better here. But um, I think what scalping is, there, there's a few ways to look at it. Yeah, I know he has bad audio. I see everyone's commenting on it right now. Um, yeah. The one thing with scalping is is that you can really there, there's a couple ways to look at it i should say number one is there's this type of scalper that i was when i first started where you're just scalping all day long and you're just working the bid working the offering you're trying to make a couple of ticks and you're really just only risking a couple of ticks at a crack right yeah. and then there's a, another really style of scalping which i think is more of what you do we're going to get into the really the details today but where you just maybe find an, a couple of areas that you really like and when you get to that area, you scalp off of that area. You're not just sitting there working the bid and offer all day long and just sitting there. You know, as I think initially, that's what a lot of people think of. That's that's what I did. You're focused yep. really on an area. And when it gets there, you're just scalping off that area. Am I wrong? No, you're, you're exactly right about that. I, I'm just really, really, I guess you could say really, really particular on when, when I actually get into a market. Yeah, everyone's saying your audio is still bad. I mean, maybe if you want to log out and log back in, we can try that real quick because it, it, it is um, a little a little scratchy. We're not able to, to hear you that well. Um, so maybe we'll let Cheeto go out and come back in. 
you know, throughout the conversation today, everybody, I will tell you this, put your comments and questions in there along the way. Um, we definitely want to hear from you about it. And as Cheeto is going to get his audio potentially uh, fixed here and come back in, uh, it's funny, we were testing it beforehand and it was working fine. Somehow that's, that's what happens when you go live. This can happen. So he'll be right back. You know, I just want to talk about really the different types of scalping while we wait for Cheeto, because this is really, I think, something that is very important. Like I said, when I did test beforehand, believe me, I see I see it in there. We were working fine. Sometimes when you go live, that's what happens. Um, when you are scalping, and like I said, the way that I learned really with the guys from the pit, we're just working the bid and offer all day along. Not necessarily every bid, every offer, but areas that we kind of liked. You know, um, a lot of that was dependent on on the brokers and stuff like that, what they were doing. But then when I went to the screen, you know, using the technical indicators to choose. And I think that, I think when initially when people think of scalping, they think of, hey, let me come in and I'm just gonna be really active, uh, you know, and I'm just gonna try and make a couple of ticks here and there, right? And, and, and that to me is in this day and age, a very difficult way to do it. Number one, you got the cost, the expenses is, is high. You know, I mean, everybody's paying, you know, exchange fees and commissions. We got Cheeto coming back. We'll see. Maybe his audio is getting better. Um, and you also have um, just the algos are just too fast. I think the audio is going to be better here. Now let's do a quick test. Can you hear me, Cheeto? Yes, I can hear you. All right. We're, we're going, baby. We're good. See, we got it. Um, I just want to finish the thought. I was talking about everybody to everybody about the two different styles of scalping. And like I said, where I came from, we're like we were members of the exchange. We were able to scalp a lot. The costs weren't there. You know, we could work the bid and offer all day long. And also the S&P uh, at that time, as we're going to talk about that uh, a lot, the ranges weren't as, as big. So we were able to lean on a lot more prices. Prices meant a lot more than they do now. You have a lot more volatility in the market. And when markets get more volatile, it's very difficult to just sit there and scalp all day. And I don't think that anybody uh, would go out there and say that that's a great strategy, right? Just sit there and try and, you know, just pick them apart all day because eventually you're going to get picked apart. And your style and why I really flocked to, to people like you and watch how you guys are doing it. I love it because it's very disciplined. It's very structured. There's homework that goes into it well before you even get in there. It's not like you're just going in there and scalping futures all day. And then you get to the point where you get to your level and you're, you're going after it. Yes. Yes. It's uh, you got, you got to be very discretionary when you're trading the way I trade and I trade with, uh, I trade a lot differently than most. And like you said, if you were sitting there scalping in and out, in and out all day, you're just going to get chopped up more than likely, or you're going to get commissioned out. You're going to make a lot of money for your broker. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I want to get to really the next thing I think is important, you know, as we talked really kind of like what is scalping, but Chino, what type of person do you think chooses scalping as a style? A person who doesn't want to sleep that much. <laughs> no, but uh, so I think, I think the style actually chooses the person. I think that you go through uh, trade when you first start out, start out trading. And I think the style actually comes to the person at, at a certain point in time. I think that you figure out what doesn't work, um, I'd say, for a couple years and lose a, a lot of money like I did, unless, unless you're fortunate to have a mentor to, to show you the ropes. And that was kind of the path that I took. I, I took the path of uh, uh, the wooded path through the jungle with a machete is basically what what, what the path that I took. And uh, I think that the thing that helped me choose and what chose me was, is when I finally just kind of uh, took my target and my, my risk level down a notch, instead of, instead of me saying, oh, I want to take this much out of the market. I just threw that away. You know, uh, a lot of people talk about, um, making X amount of dollars per day, I don't have that mindset. And I think that, I think that any profession is going to know uh, what I'm saying at, at this point when I'm talking about that you can't expect a dollar amount when you're trading. You, you get what the market gives you. And so when I, when I realized that, I, could, I felt like I could 
fine tune how I traded, which is which best fit me, which was scalping. Yeah, I think you make an important point. I think that the style does pick the trader. The trader doesn't pick the style. I think that's extremely important. Uh, I guess maybe I'll ask it about a, a, a different way. Um, what characteristics of a person do you think would have scalping choose them as a trader? Someone who is very impatient and likes to to get in and out of a trade pretty quickly. Um, a uh, person who likes to control the trade, uh, even though that's that's virtually impossible. The, the trade is going to control itself. Uh, you learn, I learned that over time. So I think those are the qualities and things that characteristics that could actually define uh, a person that wants to scalp. Um, I think those are the two main ones, I would say. You, you know, somebody who's kind of antsy, who doesn't like to sit around and wait a long time to for something to play out sit there and chop around I, I just that makes me go crazy i can't sit there and watch a position go up and down and you know i could i, I could probably scalp it and make the points and be on my porch by that time <laughs> um uh, yeah i know you love putting the tweets out about it off to the porch but i think that you make an important point because and the, the reason why i'm bringing this up is because i think that too many people out there when they get to futures and they look at scalping, they look at it as, oh, this is a way I could just come in and just make a couple of ticks here and there. And, you know, and I can make money every day and, and that's the way I go about it. But it really does take a specific type of person. I mean, I know that for me, the way you explain that is exactly the way that I am as a person. And, you know, I'm somebody who is, when I'm in swing trades, it took me years, actually, I'm doing that these days a lot more. I sit there and I'm just like, I. it's more stressful for me to be in a trade that long than for me to just sit there and go at them hard and get in yeah. and out. And, you know, because my mind just operates that way. My one buddy um, who was very successful at this and we were, became very good friends. I met him actually in the middle of my career. I mean, the guy was awesome at it. And he was just like, you know, he just kept, he just moves on, you know, and we used to laugh about it. He's just like super positive moving on. Like, okay, look at, you know, he just burns out of losers. You know, he doesn't hold on to much baggage. Um, but you've got to have that type of mentality because when you are scalping, you've got to let that shit go. You just got to let it go and you're going to be burned out of losers that are in big positions and you've got to do real, that really quick because that's part of that game, right? If you're going to play that game, you, you've really got to be um, that type of person who um, just has that willingness, that that just ability to just, just do it, click that button free. Um, that's kind of going to bring me to my next question for you is that when we talk about scalping, how what do you think is the is the is the process someone should go through to develop a type of strategy uh, to develop a strategy? Well, process is very important. I think it begins with uh, knowing yourself and your process. It's it trading is habitual. You need to have uh, you need to have certain things that you do all the time. That there's habits in the morning, like like in the evening time when I'm when I'm writing my plan, and I'm reviewing charts from the previous day. Um, I have a I have a certain amount of time. I get in a, a quiet place, no distractions, no TV, no kids, anything. And so I think that's an important part. It starts with uh, the process. You need to have uh, habits that you get into that so that you can pick a process. So a process for developing your scalping strategy, you need to look at repeatable things that happen in the market that uh, things that that you see over and over and over again, you go, wait a second, something's happening here. I saw that the other day on this other chart. What's happening? What's going on here? And when you when you start to notice these things, that's when you can say, okay, well, is there any significance to it? Uh, can I backtest this? And if there is, that's when you start running. That's, that's, that's where you start beginning the process of your methodology and, and getting to the point to where implementing it down the road would be, you know, what you would be wanting to do. 
you know, RK actually put a question in, I think is extremely important. And I think it's something that we, we could talk about right now. I'll take the questions along the way if they make sense to, but a lot of the questions we'll do at the end with Cheeto, because uh, we're actually going to go through a lot of slides today where he's going to show us his strategy. But before we get there, I think it's important just to understand, you know, about scalping and things like that. Um, and just what his process is, his mindset is. Uh, as, as I always say, I want to teach people how to think, not tell them what to think. And I think one of the things that RK talks about is please talk about exit stops risk management. You know, how do you go about that? I mean, uh, how do you go on about uh, stops uh, and exits when you're scalping for such short ticks? So I kind of adopted uh, Rashke's um, uh, kind of mindset on when I initially place a trade, I will have a hard stop. And so, you know, whatever that is, it's different for everybody. Account size, I won't go into that. But uh, I have a hard stop that I place. And then I'll finesse my uh, stop up uh, to a certain extent uh, after the trade starts working or going against me. So if it goes against me, you know, the flat button, the flatten button is your friend. Uh, it's not a friend I'd like to get to know every day, but uh, it is there. But uh, I've used that uh, for the majority of my trading. So the exit portion of it, that's a hard thing to talk about. Um, I think that comes in with the process and how you're developing your edge, uh, what you're playing for. So me as a scalper, I'm not playing for much. So I'm only going for half a point, to a point to two, uh, it, more if I can get it. But um, your risk management has to do with your, your account size and what you're playing for and what kind of probability and significance on uh, your strategy that you back tested. So all, this is all homework behind the scenes before you can get into a trade. So I, I did a lot of months and months of back testing on things that, that I'm very discretionary on that I have to go back in charts for a long time to say, okay, is, do, does this have any significance uh, when I'm looking at one of my setups? So I think that's, you know, when you touch on risk management and stops and what you can get and exits on the market, uh, I, I really don't look at risk reward ratio. I look at how well I can manage my position and take what I can take out of the market. Uh, you get what you get and when you place a trade, you just, everyone's different. You, they're not all the same. I, I've always said that. I said, not every trade is the same. Why would you trade every trade the same? Yes. Now, I feel like people that trade consist, they think they're being consistent by trading the same size contracts every single day aren't really trading, right? I mean, you might as well just become somebody who just creates a system and just go automate it. Because if you're, that's all you're going to do, then that's all you're going to do. I mean, um, a big part, I think, when you're looking at scalping, um, which is what I did for a majority of my career, I did pretty well at it. It is really, a lot of it is, like you said, you don't know what you're gonna get out of it. You 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 just know where you're gonna be wrong. So you, you're you going off of the hard stop, which I think is important. You know, I, I personally never ever, when I'm scalping work stops, I just click in and click out. Um, I think some people just feel more comfortable with the hard stop for me. Um, the minute it's not working, especially if I'm scalping, I just burn out of it. I think, I don't know that necessarily for a scalper, um, that you need to have the hard stop. But I think if it works for you, either way, but you just got to be committed to it. Um, and and make, make a great point. Is you don't know how much it's going to go your way, I think. But the one thing that I, it sounds like is that you're, 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 you're peeling off of a large position that you're getting in. Is it potentially all at once? It sounds to me kind of like that. And then you're just peeling it off and saying, maybe it'll keep going. I don't know, but I'm or immediately getting out uh, for the winner, like I would be getting out for a loser, but you're scaling it. You're talking about the actual getting out of the trade and, or taking partial. Or... Yeah. I mean, like the scale of getting out, I mean, cause you're talking about, you have a hard stop to, to, to when you're dumping it, but getting out, you said sometimes it's 50 cents. So you'll take a little bit is, and you don't know how far it'll go. So is it like, is it big all in at once and then just peeling it off or how, how is your, how is your execution on that? So I guess it depends on the trade. So uh, just uh, yesterday, I placed a trade and uh, it went up five points. Well, it, within you know seconds. And usually, when I when I get you know a five point move like that, I'll just go ahead and I'll just peel it all off at the same time. Um, 
but if I start seeing something like a 10 or 15 point move, I may just pull like 50% of it off, move the stop up to like break even and let the rest run, you know, and then kill off, you know, a quarter at a time. Um, it just depends on how the trade and how the, the trade plays out. Like you said, it, it, each one's different. But I will say that um, I'll, I'll give you a, an instance where the hard stop actually paid off. When I say paid off, I actually lost quite a bit of money. So when COVID first started, I was trading uh, ES, and I had my, my I had ten point stop in, and I got into uh, a trade, and. <laughs> Within one, two seconds, I was stopped out. I was like, what just happened here? Did news hit, you know? And so I looked at the market and you know, everything was okay. I still had liquidity on the book. I was like, what the heck? It's just, it's just, a, it's just an offshoot, you know, thing. So I, I clicked in again. And um, and I get I get popped again on another 10 points. I was like, okay, time to step back here. You know, I've lost 20 points here. Uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because it's happened to me many times, so I can't yeah. laugh about it. But yeah, and so I mean, this is you know, I'm like, what's going on here? So I'm, you know, I start to look at things after a little while, figure out, okay, uh, we we've got COVID going on here. So I had to widen. I cut my position halfway, uh, cut my size down halfway, and widen my stop to 20 points, and uh, stood stood back, looked at the slope of the market, uh, got a gauge, and actually, you know started trading got i got the points back uh, not all the same day but i was able to uh to turn it around i would say so the hard stop um is a saving grace when it comes to uh protecting you because you know a news event happens it, or a black swan type thing happens or you know you need to have something in the market to protect you and that's the reason why my heart stops there yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, for me, the way that I was a scalper, like if I had a 10 point risk on any trade, I always put a stop in. Yes. Um, it was funny. You and I were even talking earlier uh, when we were doing the test um, and I got, to, <laughs> I actually got clicked out of some stuff. I was clicking out of stuff and he, and he heard my order filled stuff. I was, we were kind of laughing about that, but um, yeah, anytime I have some sort of distance, what I'm saying for when I'm trying to risk 50 cents or a buck, you know, um, when I did it, uh, I didn't use stops. Um, now I'm more of an intraday swing trader uh, to multi-day and I always use stops. I think obviously, you know, but I was saying if I'm trying to make uh, or lean on two ticks, uh, I'm clicking in a lot of times they'll just, I don't want to be the one tick on the stop. I'll just burn out of it. Um, yeah. So I think it's different, but I agree that it absolutely is an important point um, of, of having that. I mean, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is actually, I actually are getting a lot of questions here, which I think maybe I'll start using some of them because we're going to go to the slides for Cheeto and maybe some of them will answer um, I'll answer some of these, but, um, I think this is something that we'll talk about really before, um, we get to the strategy. Cause actually I'll, we'll take a quick break before we get into that and load up all the stuff. And, and this is a great question, you know, just talking about trading for a living, because what we're talking about here is a style that this is the day trader really style, right? When you're coming to futures traders, um, you're coming to futures markets. People look at this as the, the I would say, I don't know if it's the most popular way, but I would say it's definitely up there in terms of um, style, not strategy, folks, style. People come in and they want to be in and out of the futures markets every day. They're not going home uh, with position. So it's obviously, I think, especially for um, newer people, the futures, um, this is the way that they're doing it. Um, How has that been for you? You know, what's that? What was that like, um, you know, getting to the, to, the, to the point where you're able to do this for a living? It was, uh, it took me a lot of years to get it to where I could, it took me seven years to get to where I'm, where I could feel confident, where I could actually just quit my job and do it for a full-time full job. Um, it's very stressful, very stressful, which is one of the reasons why, uh, going back to, you know, picking how you want to trade. I don't like to be in the market that long because I feel like it's less stress on me, uh, the mental capital. Um, Cause when you're trading size, it's very stressful. Um, I think that plays a big role in it. Uh, when you're trading for a living, I mean, you just kind of, 
it's it's one of those, it's not for everybody. It's something like when 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 a kid when you're growing up, you want to be a firefighter. I mean, a kid once says he wants to be a firefighter or a policeman. Uh, I don't think a lot of kids go, oh, I want to be a day trader. <laughs> you know, it's just not one of those things that um, I feel like it's a a good fit for everyone. But uh, yeah, it, it kind of just latched on to me when I first started to get into the markets. Uh, I think that a lot of people uh, think it's glamorous, but uh, there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes to be able to do this for a living. Yeah, I, I think, you know, look at me, I'm hosting a podcast talking about trading. I don't think that trading for a living is for most people. I think for most yeah. people, trading uh, is an additional way for income, but but you look at it as a full-time uh, job in a sense, right? You, you may not be able to achieve the ability to make uh, the amount of money you want to make uh, as a full-time trader to be able to do this. But I think that, you know, the advice I would always give somebody is, is that, you know, when people say that so many people fail, I should say, I don't think it's because people are failing because they can't make money. It's because they can't make enough money as they want to. And so I think that's the reason why the stats are always skewed against traders failing. I think it comes out of frustration and expectations that puts them in a bad spot. You know, you want to be a trader for a living. Um, it, it took you seven years, you know, I mean, and, and depending on the, your age and, you know, where you're going through that, like if you're, you know, my age right now, I'm 45, if all of a sudden I want to start becoming a day trader. Well, my life's got so many different expenses and things going on. It's just not reality. If you're in your twenties or if you're in my age or, or older and you have some money and you want to eventually, you want to be able to do this, it all comes down to circumstances. Um, and even then it's not necessarily going to be <laughs> the easiest thing to achieve, even if you have the per perfect circumstances. Um, what I want to do next is, uh, I know we see you got a ton of questions coming. And um, what I want to do is I want to go to the slides uh, with Cheeto. Um, I'm going to put everything up here and we're going to go over what you're looking at. Uh, that was a question I shouldn't have added that one. So let's go to... This first slide, Cheeto, um, you gave me seven slides. And um, so tell us what we're seeing on slide one. So on this, this is a one minute chart, ES. So the boxes that you're seeing here, those three pushes there, That's this is one of my favorite uh, setups to trade. Uh, I've, I've posted this on many times on Twitter. It's, you have to trade this discretionary. So as it three pushes down and, and then you usually have a balance or a reversal reverse from those. And so when you're looking at this, this is part of the, you know, when you're talking about process for choosing your, your strategy, this is something that I kind of uh, adapted from Linda Rashke and just took it to a, a, a more zoomed in approach. So this is, you know, three push down and, uh, and a reversal. And so this is a very, very small time frame, but you can make a lot of uh, uh, money if you can recognize patterns like this, especially around, you know, like uh, previous uh, high a day uh, opening price. And when you put in pivots in conjunction with this, it's going to be very, very powerful. So let me just kind of recap this here. You got three squares around this. This is a one minute uh, chart. And what's the moving average in there? What is that? Just a five? Yeah, it's a five. five so, it's, so it's a five period. So it's just really a five minute moving average. And what you're looking for is these three pushes down. And what you're saying is once that candle makes that type of low like that. So this isn't something that's a predetermined price. So you're looking for this as it's happening. And then when it comes off that low, you're looking for it as a long. Am I, am I saying? Got it. So I guess I would say, and I'm sure a lot of people looking at this would say, well, how do I know, like, what is the trigger that, um, for the entry? So is it after this red candle, the second one down, then it turns, uh, you see that you have your blue candle gets, is it above that body? Is it just a buy then leaning on that stop? Like, tell us how that would work. Uh, if you go to the, uh, I believe it's the third slide. I actually Let's have go to the a... third slide. So, yeah. So right here, so that where I've got the yellow uh, dotted there, yellow dotted box. So you have that first uh, kind of bluish candle that has the long wick on the bottom, and you have a, a red candle to the right of it has a wick going to the towards the top. So if you look at if you 
you research three bars. And this is something else that Linda Rashke talks about. She talks about balance. And so when I'm looking at balance, I'm looking at something that can be contained within those two R's. And so you can look to the right where there wasn't much action. So if you were to draw a line at the top of that wick of the red candle and a line at the bottom, uh, I view that as balance, whether it be daily balance, weekly balance, uh, minute, tick balance. And um, once you come out of balance after seeing a three push down, of course, being discretionary on this, uh, I would look to enter uh, above the next, uh, either above or below that wick. And as you see, you know, once we turned up on uh, out of that uh, out of that whip area at the top, we actually propelled upwards. So, you know, taking these uh, little short scouts like this can be profitable as long as your targets aren't too wide. If you got a 10 point goal, you know, you may not hit it with these type of trades because it's such a short time frame. But the risk is very defined. Yes, it's very defined. I mean, and so if, if I were to take this trade, uh, my stop would, you know, of course, my hard stop would be in, of course, once I place a trade. And uh, I would finesse it up probably to break even or blow the wick of the actual third push uh, to, let, to let the trade have a little uh, room to breathe, so to speak, and see what you can get out of it, you know, uh, cut off, you know, 80% of it, let the other run or just, you know, pop right out of it, which I usually do is just get out, get out of the trade, squash it completely. Would you say that really the goal when you're building your strategy is, is to really, obviously it's from a scalper's mindset, um, you want to always be as close to um, your stop, your entry is as close to your stop as possible. Um, you even talked about having 10 handle wide stops, which is, you know, that's a pretty wide stop. Obviously, the volatility and the conditions are going to determine that because there, during that time, 10 bucks was nothing, like you said. Yeah. But is a big part of you developing your strategy to say, look, and I'm I'm not really looking for these really super wide targets. Like people would say, oh, look, I think X, we could go this far, right? Everyone always talks about the potential. Um, but in here, you're talking about really just finding that moment where you're just looking for that really cheap risk for an unknown reward, but it, it's not a greedy reward. It's just an unknown and just get your risk off as fast as you can. Yes, that's exactly what I'm looking for here. And so if I can get two ticks out of this, I'm happy, you know, which, you know, two ticks is easy to get usually, you know, when you're scalping. So if I can get a point or two out of this, it's, it's, it's great. I'm not looking for the home runs out of this stuff. Every now and then you will catch uh, a big move. And sometimes you just have to, after you've been scalping a while, you have to, you, you'll know when those times happen. Because those times when the big moves happen, they'll usually be around um, your previous uh, day high, low or a pivot area, uh, uh, an area in which uh, there's a lot of activity or there was previous activity at one time. So it, it just comes with experience. I think experience on uh, executing uh, your strategy, it kind of helps you get into a, a, I guess, a comfortable groove, yeah, uh, so to speak. And you kind of go, oh, wait, this happened before. Maybe I should just, you know, tweak this a little bit. Maybe I'll just let one run this time. And then you go, wait a second. That, that, I'm starting to see a pattern here, you know, and that, that it, it can always lead to you back testing something else. You know, okay, uh, things are changing. I need to re back test this. You know, it, it, there's a lot of things that can happen uh, once you get into actually trading your strategy versus back testing it. I hate to use the word feel a lot, but. To me, feel and rhythm when you're scalping is so important because, you know, you can look at the order flow. I don't even need to see it, you know, because I can feel it. You know, if I buy yeah. something or sell something and my response is exactly what I'm looking for, then I kind of know sometimes where it's like, you know, sometimes I'll lift an offer, uh, you know, or go to not maybe not the entire offer, but a big portion of it. And it's just gone. You know, all of a sudden it's just it's a buck my way. You're like, okay, well, 
you could feel the sensitivity of the market at that point, you know, and sometimes you'll, you'll buy into an offer or sell into a bid and it's just like, <laughs> bam, <laughs> you know, you just know. And so you feel yeah. that, especially as a scalper, it's one of those things where you're like, woo, that wasn't good. But then you, you, you hit it and it it's turns and it goes your way and you're kind of like, hmm. You know, then I'm a little I'm a little slower to bleed out of it versus the one that hit hit like a wall or just kind of like eventually rolled. Then maybe I'm scratching some. I mean, do you agree with that? Like that's part of like that rhythm and that feel is is that immediate response when you're looking at a strategy like this? Yes, yes. Actually, I was trading this morning and I I, I made a, a call and and actually entered the position and it didn't go exactly the way I wanted. It actually turned against me. And then when it came back up to break even, I went above, actually just rolled out of the position completely because, uh, you know, it didn't give me the response. You know, you can feel it, you know, what the reaction should be if you're right. So I think, I think feel is feeling and knowing your strategy forwards and backwards and, and trading it for a while uh, is definitely an edge in itself. I agree. And Mike H is saying, uh, he goes, you lost me at you'll just know and feel when you let feelings dictate your trading decisions. No bueno, my friend. I would say no to that because I think it just depends on what type of trader you are, Mike. Uh, you know, And I think that you know everybody drills this like we're all robots out there. I've been saying for years, it's not the case. You know, I fight against that because I've made a good deal of money in this business by not being a robot and by just not, I wouldn't say feel. It, it's, it's one of those things where when I say feel, um, or when I say, um, you just know, like what, what Mike was saying that he said that we mentioned this, it, it, what that is, is that that's the pattern recognition inside of us. Cause I think, you know, I, Jared Tendler's talked about this a lot with me. He's like, you know, people are just really good pattern recognizers. And that's something that you and I, because we've seen that reaction, I think that it triggers a feeling, but it's not a feeling of like, oh, this feels good. I feel like this is going to be a winner. No, it's like, I like that response and the feedback I'm getting is that positive um, feeling that you wanted. So I think that's the difference. Am I wrong here on Cheeto? Maybe touch base on that a little bit because I think it's a good question by Mike. Yeah, it is a good question. You know, I think you're right about that. I think you're expecting a response. And if you don't get that response, because, you know, you have muscle memory when you're, that, when I place a trade, I have, I have memory on thousands of other trades that I've done previous and you know not the exact same trade but it's the same setup and if you don't get the response you that you don't that you think you should get you go wait a second you have that feeling down in, in your gut and, and like you said I think I think that feeling you need to trust that feeling once you once you've had enough experience trading your your, your setup I think it, it really it's a turning. It's like a light bulb moment uh, when you've been trading for a long time. Yeah, Strizzy J nailed it, and he's right. I mean, thanks for putting this out there because you're right. It's just the wording I was using was wrong. He says it's not feel, it's intuition. Once you do this long enough, you have an unconscious, intuitive understanding of what you're seeing. You nailed that. I mean, I couldn't have said it better. I thought that was great. We've seen a lot of people comment about this. It's subconscious pattern recognition. It's a professional's best tool. You know. I'm seeing a lot of comments about this. Feel feel is like seeing the movie play out you've seen over and over again. Um, and then uh, it's experience trading that develops the feel, or I would actually call it intuition. Exactly. You know, I think that, you know, everybody counts so much on finding the perfect strategy, but when it comes down to it, and I've done a ton of shows on this, whether it's with Morad or PAX or just a lot of different people, execution is such an, such an important aspect of it. Cheeto, do you think if you taught somebody this exact same strategy exactly the way that you do it and show them every single thing exactly the way that you're doing it, that they would have the same results as you? No. You, you, you have to understand the, the probabilities and when to apply the strategy. You have to have an understanding of that. And you have to not only have to have an understanding of when to place the trade, you have to have an understanding of your own feeling before you place the trade so there's a lot that goes into this because the market is very psychological uh, you know i firmly believe you know i don't want to cuss on your live stream but i think that uh that a lot of people uh feel like they're getting screwed in the market over and over and it happens to a lot of people because it is so psychological so i think that uh that plays a, a big a big portion um, the whole environment that you're in. 
Yeah, no doubt. I mean, let's move on to some of these other slides because I think we're we're getting great interaction. I know your audio has been kind of breaking up again, but it is what it is, everybody. Like I said, we tested it. Sometimes you go live, it just happens. Yeah. But um, uh, so just bear with us. Uh, Cheeto, what slide would you like me to go to next? We we skipped over two. Should I hop back there? Is there something there you want to show us? No. Um, or, part of your show, and, you know, it, it just gives you a, a better, an easier way to look at the three pushes. I just want to throw that in there, you know. If you're not used to looking at, you know, like a bar chart or a candlestick chart, you can see it easily on a line chart. Yeah, I think, yeah, once again, I mean, you, when you look at an example like this from anybody, you know, if you want to use it in your own form of chart, like I don't use candles. I like to use bars. I mean, you, you choose what you want. Um, so here we are, Cheeto. This is slide four. Um, what, are you, what, are you, what are we uh, looking at here? So this was the execution portion of, of the trade. So. It, you know, either either uh, on this specific uh, example, uh, you know, it's a long it's because we actually broke above the top wick. So if you were wanting to be aggressive and you wanted to use an actual, you know, want to get really aggressive, you would enter it at the, uh, at the red line here. Is that at 39, 39, 35 and a three quarter? And, you know, if you want to or, uh, be a little bit more cautious, and let it break out above that top or with that top wick. You take the uh, the, the top uh, the top execution. And Got so it. Sometimes it depends on what's going on in the market, how fast the tempo is going in, in, in a third push. Or because um, usually I try to take chart because I want the best execution I can get. Uh, depending on how fast the tempo is and which which area I'll actually enter in. Or I'll just scale in sometimes, but usually I'll just go with straight in full position. Okay, well, whatever. We had the audio was getting chopped up a little bit. Maybe cancel your video, and then we'll continue to look at some of these slides. Maybe that'll help with the audio. Okay. Um, keep putting everybody your questions, and I appreciate the engagement today. Um, so let's take a look here. We're on slide five now i mean the, that last slide you actually answered some of the questions i think people were asking so what, what are we seeing here cheeto so this is a five minute opening range um i kind of adapted this from mark fisher in his book the logical trader so i took the you know the open range high and your low for the first five minutes of trade and threw in your uh anc uh levels uh both up and down so your a would be two points below your uh below or above your opening range and your c being uh 1.5 points below your a which would be 3.5 points below your opening range or above and so this what this does it, it just gives you a it gives you some points you can lean on during the day i like to use this on rotational days because it's you know when, when you're rotating and you're balancing and you're chopping up, I noticed that on these certain days, it, it would bounce off of these levels all the time. It's like, well, what can I, what kind of blueprint can I put on the chart to help me understand uh, and, and have levels to lean against? And so uh, when I read his book, it kind of fit the model. So, and a lot of times when, when I trade, I'm, I trade ES exclusively. That's the only thing I trade. It's the only thing I look at. Uh, there are a lot, there's a lot of days where we're just balancing. And so uh, as the day is unfolding, I will, I will actually put these lines in by hand uh, because I feel that doing something by hand is actually engaging you and taking part of that market. And it also... You know, it helps with your subconscious. Say, okay, uh, I need to look at this level. And so that's the main purpose uh, for using this open range concept. You can actually use it for a breakout concept, you know, breaking out if you choose to. I just don't choose to use it in my uh, trading that way. All right, let's go to maybe a another slide here and see what we got. Um is this accentuating kind of what you're showing on that last one? Or let me see real quick. Yeah, that looks okay. What are we seeing here? So this is a daily. So basically with five SMA. And so before I even before I even get into you know uh, 
looking for what's going on or you know, looking at the, uh, the day, how it involves. I always like to look at a larger time frame. Even though I'm not trading a daily, I'm not swing trading, I like to see uh, are, we, are we moving up uh, in the market daily? Are we one time framing higher, um, especially if we're above the 5 SMA? So you know, we've got one, two, three, six days here. We're above the five SMA. Uh, that right there in itself, I like to keep that in my, back of my mind. Say, okay, if I'm scalping today, I probably want to be scalping long uh, yeah. because that's where the that's where the the main direction of the market is leaning. You know, that's something that I think. You know, I've talked a lot about this. You know, it's funny, um, and. I've said so many times to, to the scalpers out there when I've done these videos over the years that my daily homework will help dictate the direction intraday. And everyone would say, well, why would you look at that if you're trading in the short term? Well, because looking at a simple five-day moving average, why it, 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 would I want to be more aggressive with a short than a long if we're grinding above a measly five-day moving average? So to me, I think that your daily homework is so important in determining position sizing and potential looks during the day because in your mind you know that the bigger picture is supporting one direction and if you get a similar look like you talked about maybe you get a mean reversion uh, day like you talked about with those three push downs and a day where it's holding above the five day that might be a day where maybe you get a bigger move to the upside right uh, something like that is that kind of what you're thinking is yes yes I I, I really look for the instances where people are caught. And that's kind of how I decide where I'm going to place uh, and look for my discretionary put, you know, like the three push down. I'm looking for specific areas where people potentially could be caught. And when I see my strategy line up with that, that's when I really lean into uh, the execution or size up my position. You know, traders, he made just another great point. I'm going to be curious to see what you guys think about this When, especially when you are a scalper looking where, where you think someone's caught and is such an important tool because that's where you'll see going back to what we talk about that intuition, that reaction off of a level, because at that point you're probably taking, it's coming down or up to your price. And if it reacts to it, any traders that were in that direction that were trying to push it through and it didn't, and it, and it starts to revert back, that's where you can see really a quick rotation out. I mean, that's why I think so many of the uh, traders I speak with use the order flow so much because they can see things like that. I think order flow is, is a great tool for seeing when they're trapped. Um, I don't know, Cheeto, do you use the order flow at all? I don't use the order flow. I, I tried to use it and it just wasn't for me. I just kind of, when I see the speed of the market and the orders and the candles and on the tick charts where the candles are being formed, I can actually, I know what the speed is supposed to be in, in certain areas when certain things are happening. I just, I've been doing it for so long that I just, I just got used to seeing uh, the candles develop um, at certain areas at certain times and around certain levels to where I just, I, I hate to say it, like you said, I can just feel it when, when, and the intuition is there over thousands and thousands of trades that I've seen something uh, play out. So Swag City is talking about something. He goes, I understand being caught or trapped from a pump and dump penny stock perspective, but for ES and NAS, I really don't see how that's possible. Well, it's just really in those short moments. You know, I remember something. There's a, when you come into futures traders, a, uh, everybody in the futures markets, a, a lot of the people trading it are really doing, a, 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 the market makers are doing a lot of size, right? So to see when they're trapped or when a market gets to an area where all of a sudden it has a great response where the um, w w whichever direction we were going in and um, people that are in that direction are, are now potentially trapped um, for a, a reversion or something like that. And that does happen uh, in the futures markets quite a bit. Uh, now the NASDAQ's a little different. I would say I don't look for that as much in the NASDAQ because it's just the prices aren't as important. But the S&P, you'll still see things build and then rotate off or like, you know, 
um, you'll, you'll just see that the shorts keep maybe selling into the bid on the way up and all of a sudden you get an explosion higher. So maybe it stays within trend. You could see that more in the ES or feel it. The NASDAQ, so it's a little different. I would say, yeah, I probably agree. I, I don't look for that as much. I look for that more on a level basis where it's like, oh, hey, you know, they, um, the longs are just sitting or leaning on something and, um, and all of a sudden uh, they're starting to rotate out of it. So I think that they're wrong from leaning on something. Um, but it's, it, it is possible. Um, you know what I mean, Cheeto? I think it's a good question. I don't know what you thought about it. Yeah. Uh, you just have to look for certain areas like, 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 you know, people are looking at certain resistance areas. I like to look at the, the places where everybody's looking. And yes. then after I look at where everybody else is looking, I look beyond that. I look beyond and I think beyond that. And I think, okay, what can happen if it goes past this point and it keeps going past this point? You know, or is everybody going to think, oh, it's just, it's just going to plummet. We're in a, we're in a bear market. It's never going to go up again. Well, no. What's going to happen is, is there's probably going to be a three push and I'm going to be on the other side of you. That's, that's, that's the way I'm thinking. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, let's go to the slide number seven because we're almost out of time here, and I know we've got some questions still I want to get to. So final slide, what are we seeing here? So this was the uh, the opening range concept here. So we, you know, from the beginning of that slide, we actually made an A down. And so just having this plotted out on the chart, uh, having seeing that C up area, the gray line there, and you can see that we, we tried to push through it the first time to the left and then you know we kind of chill back off to that green area right there which was the opening price and 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 we, once we made that second push up through there it actually it actually made it through so i, I highlighted this area because that red candle you have that's that's it's a small balance it's two candles but that's a three bar setup so when you blast it to the top of that wick there through the c that's very significant that c up because it, it already tried to go up one time, maybe maybe buyers were successful. Then sellers came in and pounced it down. I like to look at these these uh, these areas, especially when it's hit a couple times and it lines up with the uh, open range concept. I like to take a long or a short against these areas. So in the, in this right here, this is one of my favorite setups too. Is is when you lean lean on these A and C areas up or down. You can usually get, you know, one to two points out of these pretty easily and just, you know, call it a day. So this is a trade where, I mean, I could see a couple different ways that I would approach trading this. So what is the specific way that you would be be trading this once you see this set up? I would, I would be putting a buy stop, you know, a ticker, a ticker two above the, the top of that, that wick of the red candle there. Yeah. Or you can actually put a sell stop. Uh, below, which would be the top of the open range, which I normally would not take that, especially if we've already made a down. Because if you're if you're, if you're at the top of the open range high, uh, I tend to not want to go short uh, unless we're at the, the opposite end of the range. Um, I, I kind of adopted that from Mark Fisher, and I kind of helped with it uh, over the years. So I mean, you could take either position if you're scalping. But for for this example, uh, I would I would be leaning long in this position. Yeah, because also you know I guess that would a couple of things also would happen. I guess we talked about your daily chart, especially would you look at that like what if this was trending lower uh, the market in the big picture and then you had um, you know this this rally would you be more inclined to take the long? Or would you be inclined to potentially look for a short versus like, let's just say this time we have, well, you know, maybe we're above the five day moving average. Would that lean more along? How much does that come into play when this setup starts to come in? Yes. So, yeah, that's a good point there. So when you when you're looking at if you say if, you're, if you were trending up and then, or trending down and you're below the five SMA, I would be very, very cautious on on taking a long, uh, long term. Uh, outside of just a scalp for a point or two. Uh, anything is tradable, but uh, you need to have that in your mind that if you come back below that C, you probably need to be getting short. Because yeah. Yeah, the, these things can, you, you saw like we did yesterday, where you know the market's up and then all of a sudden it's, it's down. 
you know, you're, you're going right back down, back to opening price. You're going back down to the bottom of the range. So these these trades can turn against you in a heartbeat. Yeah, no doubt. All right, we only got a few minutes left. I want to just go to. Unfortunately, I know uh, we don't have the we don't have the video, but we know you're there. Um, just a few questions, and then we'll go. Um, Rob is uh, asking, when do you decide to walk away daily limit for loss or gain? I think the best way to always answer these is like, you know, not the dollar amount because we're not asking you to do that. But I think like a percentage of the account uh, as a scalper, what are you looking at on the daily uh, limit loss or gain? For myself, um, I have a, a set point goal in mind. Uh, and if I lose an X amount of points, uh, of course, it, like you said, it depends on your account size. It's different for everybody. But yeah. if I lose a, a certain percentage of points or just... You know, more than uh, one to two percent of my account, I, I'm done for the day. If I if I have a two percent drawdown on my account, then you know I'm usually not trading the rest of the day. Yeah, I think two percent. I mean, it's a good number. I mean, for me, I try to keep it right around that area too, two two and a half percent. And after that, I start knowing I'm just trading like crap. I don't deserve to be trading right now. Um, so Nick Carter is asking, besides Mark Fisher's ACD book, are there any other resources books that Cheeto recommends? Uh, I like Linda Rafke's uh, Street Smarts book. That's one of my favorites. It's, it's an oldie but a goodie. Yeah, I, I never read that one, but um, I've talked with Linda so many times, she's going to be pissed I didn't read it, but I saw the, the Sardine one was good. That was recently. Yeah, I, um, I like it. There's a, there's a lot of questions that were kind of like uh, redundant or things that we talked about already today. I think just because we're near the end of time and, you know, I just want to, I, I think we leave on this note. I mean, Cheeto, we talked about a lot of different things today. I guess when it comes to, you know, learning how to scalp uh, successfully, uh, what would be the advice you'd give to everybody out there? If you want to learn how to scalp, I would say that you need to trade the minimum amount of size. Uh, for a good amount of a good period of time, you know, three to six months, and really, and really understand what your your method is and your strategy, and back test it, and see if you can see a repeatable uh, a repeatable occurrence of it. You know, I think uh, if you have that determination, uh, you, you put the work in. I think that you, over time, I think you could be successful. Yeah. No, that's great advice. And, you know, I, I appreciate your time so much. Um, I I can't wait to having you back. I think what you and I will do a longer uh, test of the audio to make sure it's good because there was a ton of great info today. You know, it was great to actually meet you, um, you know, e-meet you. Uh, you're a good dude, a great follow on Twitter. Um, and, you know, I, like I said, I thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to the next call that we have. And we'll talk more and more about scalping, man. Thank you so much, my friend, for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. All right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, thanks for, for dealing uh, with us. We had some audio uh, issues from the start, but really overall, just uh, I can't thank you guys so much. Thank you so much for joining in today, and that's a wrap. And then I will see you guys next week, everybody. So that does it for today. See you. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review on iTunes. Never miss an episode. Go to anthonycrudelli.com and get on our email list for show notifications and for free content that is exclusively for subscribers. Also on anthonycrudelli.com, you will find tons of videos and education on trading futures, options, and crypto. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Opinions expressed are solely my own and my guests, and they do not express the views or opinions of my sponsors. Future's radio show is produced by Crudelli Productions.